One, two, three, four. Well, my lady, she loved to move when the needle's in the groove. She takes the panel from the cover, she controls the tempo and the mood. Sometimes she like it bubble and voice form. Other times she like it romantic and so far. Mm, she really did. Because she really loved the mood when the needles in the groove. Oh, yeah. She asked all the boys around to listen to her hi-fi sounds. She bit it fast, she bit it slow, she bit it high, she bit it low. She rock and roll all alone. She dancing and a whip to a favorite song. Oh, yeah. Because she really loved the mood when the need is in the room. Oh, yeah. So joining me on the big interview this week is a man who can be described in two words, rock legend. Pat McManus is with me in the studio. Pat, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Robin. It's lovely to be here. Great to have you here. We've talked on the phone before, but we've never actually done a face-to-face -face interview ago. like this. A so long a, time ago. A long time coming. Yeah. You were telling me there about uh, the new album. You've got that on the minute. Tell us all about that. It's a more bluesy based album. It's a very, I usually, my albums are usually a very eclectic mix of different kinds of music. But this one I've stuck more or less to, to, to the, the blues rock genre this time. And I was very pleased with the way it turned out. I recorded it uh, locally in Dungan in the Starlight Studios there and uh, did it over a period of, of, of uh, a couple of weeks. And uh, it's now called Tattooed in Blue and we're out promoting it and playing wherever we can with it. Brilliant. And you kind of get labelled as a blues musician these days. You seem to be doing all the blues festivals yeah. around the place. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's uh, 
when you get to my age, it's more sensible to do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my excuse. I mean, I'm sticking to it. So this time of year, it's festival seasons. So you yeah. must be busy playing all over yes, the place. Yes, we were. We were just back from the UK where we did the Linton Festival over there as well, which is a fabulous. It's on a farm. And uh, there's so, it's, it's quite bizarre because they put down bales of hay and the people sit on the bales. It's all very relaxed and chill, but some great bands, all, all, the, all the blues rock bands do it, you know, so, so it, it was lovely to be part of that. So we're just back from that and we, we, we kind of stuck a few dates around that little festival as well. So we kind of do that and then uh, later on, a few weeks time, we're off to France to do a couple of festivals over there. And we walk away sort of from, from Brittany down to the, the, the south of France. Lovely. Yeah, and then we're off to Spain to do a, a little festival there as well. So, you know, it, it kind of all ties in nicely. And then back to Northern Ireland, you've got this festival coming up in Armagh, haven't you? Oh, yes, we do. The, the, the Seven Hills on the, on the, the 10th of August. Uh, that's, that's a great festival. And that, that's a festival that has been growing legs for quite some time now. And it's getting, the attendance is really, really good. And they're just hardcore blues rock addicts that come out and they're fantastic to play to. They really are. And it's something we look forward to doing every year, you know. And uh, so anybody out there that doesn't know about it should come along because it really is a great weekend of, of music. And blues music here in Northern Ireland, it seems to be becoming even more popular again. Yeah. People always loved the Rory Gallagher stuff and stuff mm. from years ago, but it's kind of having a resurgence now, isn't it? Well, I, I think so. And I think, I think that, you know, Belfast was synonymous with, with blues music, you know. And I think that's maybe the likes of, of why Rory actually based himself out of Belfast, because there was a a good scene here in Belfast at the time. And it's never really gone away, mm -hmm. you know. There's been some great blues artists out of Belfast and it continues to be so. And we do the Belfast uh, City Blues Festival, which I love doing. It's, it's one of my, the highlights of our, of our year playing here because it's just, you know, they're, they're, there's such great enthusiastic people that come out and they really know their music and they're into their music. So, you know, the, the battle's half won before we even start playing. So was Rory Gallagher a big influence on you? Ah, oh, he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and believe it or not, anybody who was Irish or of Irish descent was a big influence on us. Gary Moore was a huge, I mean, we toured with Gary, the Mamba's Boys in the 80s. Uh, we toured all over Europe, Sweden, Stockholm, France, you name it, we did, we did the, the, the tours with Gary. And of course, uh, Eric Bell, anybody that, you know, they were all gunslingers of the highest calibre and they, they all came from around uh, uh, Belfast and, and, well, in Rory's exception, he was from Ballyshannon, really. Yeah. But, uh, but a, a phenomenal player. So people used to say to me when we do interviews, you know, who, who, you know, who, who influenced you? And I say, well, they're all Irish. And they'd look at me and go, well, what do you mean? They're all Irish. And I go, <laughs> well, Rory, Gallagher, Gary Moore, Eric Bell. Uh, you know, the list was, was fantastic, you know. So it was, it, there were some great players. So we didn't have to look anywhere else. Yeah. Way back in the beginning, it was Horse Lips were a big influence. Ah, they? yeah. They were absolutely fantastic. Yeah, band and yeah. did a lot. I mean, I think, you know, you wouldn't have had the like of Flog and Molly today and the Dropkick Morphys if it hadn't been for, for, for the horse ships. I think mm -hmm. they were the, the stopgap between all of that happening, you know, and the Pogues to some extent yeah. as well. I think I think horse ships were sort of the, the, the very beginning of all of that. So did you come from a big musical family? We did. See, my dad was born in New York. Not, not a lot of people are aware of that. And uh, he, he remembers he did the opposite thing. They came back to Ireland instead <laughs> of him. <laughs> you know, they did the opposite. They came back from, from, from New York and, and, and settled in from Ireland. That's where they were from originally, anyhow. But, uh, but he grew up listening. Uh, he remembers, you know, the Dixieland jazz bands playing outside his window. Mm -hmm. and he grew up in the Bronx. And it, so there was this real eclectic mix of music and it was always in our house as well. You know, we had an old gramophone and you'd have everything from, from John McCormick, the great tenor, to, you know, the Ink Spots. Wow. Yeah, and, we, we, and he'd let us play all those records, you know. Yeah. And then there was traditional music, there was jazz and there was, you know. So, uh, yes, and my dad was a great saxophone player. Right. And okay. he was... He was, uh, he had a band for 15 years and the, the, the toured around Ireland doing sort of dance music, you know. Yeah. And uh, then when we came along, that all changed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we formed, a, 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 as, as, as we got older, we sort of graduated into a little uh, pub band with my mum and dad because my mum sang as well. Right. So it was, it was all very, it kept together very closely like that there. And as each individual member grew up, they got uh, inaugurated into the band. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say it? That's about the best way to put it. <laughs>
Okay, so perhaps we're going to take a break from music now. You're going to do a track called To the G Man. Yeah. I think I know what it's about. Tell us the story. Well, this, this. This, was, uh, this is a song I just, it was my ode to the great Rory Gallagher, and it's, it's just a, a little message of how I felt about him and what he meant to people. So it's called The Return of the G Man. He was born with a six string in his hand. A wayward child, a smoking gun, the best in the land. And his calling card was a beat up strat, but never left his side. As he cast his magic spell right there before you rise. Take you as the crow flies to a far and distant land. As he sang a song of legend, he'd help you understand. And he tattooed the blues mm, deep into your soul. Left you burning with a passion mm, that never let you go. How I wish the return of the G Man. Oh, how I wish mm, the return of the G Man. Smile. I can still hear his music down another country mile. And he tattooed the blues so deep into your soul. Let you burn with a passion. Mm, I've never let you go. How I wish the return of the G Man. Oh, oh. How I wish Ooh, in return of the demon How I wish Oh, how I wish The return of the demon So some things people might know about you. You made your first TV appearance at the age of seven, didn't you? Yes, at Tommy's Toy Shop <laughs> here in Belfast. Oh, what was and that like? Oh, it, was, it was hilarious because I actually thought you went over and you did a little performance 
And then Tommy James brought you over to the piano and he said, pick a toy. And I thought the toy was from me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had my eye on this train set the entire time. But only discovered to my horror at the end of the show that it was going to a hospital. It wasn't going to me at all. <laughs> I think I got a book token, which I wasn't pleased with. <laughs> One bit. So that's my first memory of, of being on television. Oh, it, yeah, brilliant. it was funny, yeah. Then at the age of 14, you were the All-Ireland mm. Fiddle Champion yeah. as well, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was something we used to, where we used to do. Uh, we, we, we'd enter these competitions, the, the Flower Kill, as it's called. And uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. But, but, you know, I don't particularly, you know, subscribe to kids getting up and playing, you know, and saying, I'm better than you. Yeah. You know, it's all about collectively playing together. You know, but at the time I did it, and yes, I was fortunate enough to to win, you know, but that was the end of that. I grew my hair long and started a rock band after that. <laughs> <laughs> so who would have been the big rock influence then? Oh, Tommy, time? my brother. Tommy got a drum kit when he was very, very young. I mean, people are not aware of the fact that uh, we were touring with the likes of Bon Jovi and the Scorpions and Rush in America, and Tommy was only 15. Wow. You know, 15 years of age, and he was witnessing all the Motley Crue, Rat twisted, so we were doing the, we were doing huge stadiums, you know. Yeah. And people weren't aware of the fact that the, he was only fifteen, and because of his background and him not being well, you know, the the, the school more or less said to him, "Look, well, you know, half the time you're in hospital anyway, so you you, you might as well pursue this because it, it looks like it's a career for you." So mm. they didn't really block block him in that in that sense because he should have been at school. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Instead, he was touring around the world. <laughs> It's phenomenal, you know, from Japan to everywhere, you know. It Brilliant. Was, so he, he really packed it in. So he, but he was the, I would say he was the instigator because at the time he wasn't very well and, and he, 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 he requested from mum and dad that he get a drum kit. He was only eight or nine, maybe 10 years of age. And uh, he, they got him the drum kit and that's how the band really, really developed. This was the start of Mama's Boys. Yes, yeah. that, that was the start of it. it. It's how we really genuinely got started. We just went out to, my daddy, dad had a, we lived on a farm and we had one of the sheds and we just commandeered that and said, That's, this is ours. And we just started to play and practice. And there was no great, um, you know, scheme or plan to it. There was, mm -hmm. there was nothing like that there. It was never said, oh, let's be in a rock band and, you know, do this and, you know, conquer the world and do it. That never was the idea. It was just purely for the fun of playing. And it just developed out of that. So who came up with the name Mama's Boys? It was Tony Prince. Really? The, the, the Radio Luxembourg yeah. DJ, yes. Uh, uh, I think our, uh, our manager at the time, or would-be manager at the time, mentioned to him that he had these three young guys, and there were three brothers. And uh, he says, I don't really know what to call them, you know? And uh, it was Tony Prince came up with the name, you know, he says, sounds like Mama's Boys to me. And he says, wow. that would be great because it would sit really the opposite way with, with the music that we played, which was hard rock, you know, and then to have a name called Mama's Boys, you know, it, it was quite strange, really. You know, we had slight problem with it at the beginning, convincing us that it was a good <laughs> name, <laughs> you know, because all these other bands were heavy this and heavy that, you know, so, but it, it worked, you know, it, it kind of set us apart. And the funny thing about that was, uh, also, we, we gigged and toured throughout Ireland and the opportunities arose and uh, we we're the only unsigned act ever to play the Reading Festival. Wow. Yeah, and that's, that's all acts that, 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 I don't know what it's called now today, but the festival's still alive and well today. But we actually got to play in the Marquee in London and the organiser of that uh, gig also organised the Reading Festival at the time and we ended up on, 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 on the stages and putting that band on. So it was quite unheard of to actually yeah. have an unsane band. And of course, after that, then there was a, a bidding war for the, for the band. You and know. things seem to move quite fast. One it minute you're rehearsing on your farm and the next minute correct. you're doing these tours all over the very, place. Very, very fast, you know. And uh, it was, it was uh, quite a learning curve for us because we were still learning at the yeah. time. We were, if, I, if I look back on it now and think about it, we weren't ready at all, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we, we hadn't had time to get a grasp of, of actually what was happening. We were trying to write and learn how to write songs yeah. as well in the meantime. And yet they were pushing you out on tour and they wanted another album. And so we never really had the time to develop 
as 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 artists. It mm. was, we were really young and we, we were just still learning, you know. So and it was all it was all a bit of fun to us, you know. Yeah. We didn't take it that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the people uh, that that belonged to the band and, and, and surrounded the band and, and the record companies, they were taking it very serious. But it's, to us, it was a bit of an Irish thing. Asher, it's all a bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you're trying to get used to writing. You're trying yeah. to get used to recording. Yeah. You're playing some massive venues yeah. across the world. And of course, you have to get used to life on the road as well. And mm. when you mentioned bands like Motley Crue, mm. obviously, it must have been crazy. Crazy times off the stage yes, as well as well, on the stage. Yes, I'm not going to divulge any of the, the stories <laughs> that, uh, here now, but I can tell you one thing, that Tommy Lee and Nicky Six from the band came running out to our car and said, guys, I don't know what you have done, but whatever you've done, it's bad, they said, because the FBI is crawling around this place. He says, we're trying to get arrested in Canada, and you guys have come in here. You're not five minutes in the country, and, and they're looking for you. <laughs> but that's another story entirely. So you guys are more rock and roll than Motley Crue then? Correct, yeah. correct, <laughs> correct. They couldn't figure it out at all. <laughs> so for all the big gigs around the world that you played, is there one that stands out when you stood on stage and went, yeah, we've made it now? In, uh, no, I, I think the, the, the Reading Fest, Mm. for us. I mean, we did Milton Keynes with, you know, uh, and Nebworth and all those other big venues, fantastic, and played with Deep Purple there. And But for me, we did that, we achieved that solely by ourselves, without any record company back, and it was purely on the strength of the band, and that to me was the biggest achievement, to actually get there and, and to be unsigned and to play, you know, was a, was a incredible, uh, looking back now, we didn't think anything of it at the time. And we weren't even aware it, it was Dante Benuto from, from the Kerrang! magazine actually informed us that that happened. We weren't, I wasn't aware until recently that we were actually the only unsigned band to ever play there. So he, he, had, he actually told me about it, which was, I was gobsmacked. I didn't realize that that had happened, you know. So, you know, from, from that point of view, I think that was probably the biggest achievement. And from there on then, it was downhill. <laughs> <laughs> the record companies got involved and that was the end of that. <laughs> You know, the, the funny thing about record companies is they sign a band because they actually like what they see and hear. And as soon as they get you signed up, then they want to change it. And you yeah. go, well, hang on a second here. The reason you signed us in the first place was because you liked what you heard. Now you're trying to change it. <laughs> yeah. And did you almost fight against that? Yes, you very much so. Constantly record companies. Constantly. Yeah. yeah, and you know, they always... <clears throat> And the, the, it, 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 it's, it's a very difficult business because they, they would hang, you know, they would say to you, well, look, you know, we are the ones who, who, who are financing all of this. If, if you don't play along, we pull the plug. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you realize you've got five or six of a road crew, you've got three or four band members, and you, you, don't, want, you don't want to let the people down. Yeah. It's a livelihood to them. You know, so, so they kind of have you, they can kind of haul you over the coals and have you over that way. So it's a very, for any band, it's, mm -hmm. it's a difficult situation, you know. So of course, if you're a good musician, then you can always pick up work with other artists as well, yes. session work and stuff. And you did that for a while too, uh, I did, I did little bits and pieces, you know. Uh, I did some stuff for Gilbert O'Sullivan, Tom Jones, Samantha Fox, various, various <laughs> people, believe it or not. Well, you Samantha know. Fox stands out there. Yeah, what yeah, what yeah. did you do with Samantha Fox? Well, <laughs> uh, I played guitar on, 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 on a couple of songs of hers on our first album and she recorded one of our songs and Brilliant. yes, we, uh, not, a people, not a lot of people are aware of the fact that it was, um, uh, it was a song called Waiting for a Miracle, which we, we originally had called Spirit of America. And she recorded the Spirit of America version with the guys at a Judas Priest. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I was all pleased about that because I was into the band. So, you know, it, it was a nice accolade at the end of the day. So, yeah, no, various bits and pieces I've done throughout my time, you know. I've got to mention Celtus as well because I was such a big fan of the That Goes Around album. Yeah, yeah. The spinning wheel on the front. Yeah. And Wide Awake was a great radio song as well for you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, Sadly, by, by that stage, my brother Tommy had passed on and uh, so John and I had decided we, we'd give music a break for a little while. But when we did come back, we didn't want to do the hard rock thing anymore. We just thought, well, that's a, a chapter that's been closed and how could we replace Tommy anyway? So we kind of went back to our roots and, 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 and sort of uh, it was a mishmash of sort of people said to me, well, what was the band like? And the best description I can I can give of Celtus was that it was a cross between Planet, Pink Floyd, uh, you know, meets Pink Floyd mm -hmm. in, in that kind of thing. So it was a, a sort of a mishmash of, of that with, with, the, with the 
Celtic influence. So, and it was very successful. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you won Best Album at one yeah. of the Irish Music Awards, yeah, yeah. beating Enya, yeah. uh, the Corps, yeah. and bands like that. Yeah, you? and it, it, it was going really, really, really well. And uh, but at, at the same time. Um, I had started a family and I wanted to move back to Northern Ireland and I just wanted to get out of the rat race. I could see, with the Celtic thing, I could see the exact same thing happening again yeah. with the record company. It was, a, it was moving back in this exact same direction. I thought, I've been down this road, I don't want to do this again. So when the opportunity arose, I just upsticked and left London because I'd been living in, in London for quite some time and uh, uh, came back to Northern Ireland. Is it good to be back in Northern Ireland? That's great. Absolutely love it. And you have total control over everything you do now? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, my wife Sally is, is the manager also of the band and between us it's a little cottage industry and we do what we want to do. Yeah. And I don't have to worry about, you know, whether record companies tell me to do this or tell me to do that or, you know, magazine trying to, to please people all the time. Because uh, I found in the past that a lot of bands you're trying to please people. You're not really playing for yourself, you're trying to please, you're trying to think what they would think was good. Yes, yeah. And once you do that, you've already sold out. Yeah. So for me, it's, I just do what I do. If you like it, you like it, great. If you don't, there's plenty of others out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's a nice, a nice way to be. It, that, that's how I feel about it. No. Are, are you an ambitious person? Is there still things you want to achieve? Oh God, yes. I'd, I'd like to take this to another level as well, because I'm actually enjoying it now. Yeah. I wasn't enjoying it before that, because there was too much pressure on you know, you, you suddenly are aware of all these people that are involved in the band. You think, oh my God, this is start. This started out as music and to, as a bit of fun, and now there's this whole entourage behind me, and I'm responsible for them. And I really didn't want that responsibility. I really didn't. So now it's great. I can I can just look after myself and and do my own little thing and make my own albums, and I'm quite happy. I get to go off on tour and see parts of Europe, which is lovely, you know, and gets out of Northern Ireland for a little while when it's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> What's the rest of the year got in store for you now? Well, the rest of the, the year I've got festivals to do throughout the summertime. And then towards September, October, uh, I gear up for about a six to eight week tour of Europe, which in, it starts off in, in, in the Netherlands and into Germany, France, Austria, Switzerland, the, the list goes on. So, you know, and then we come back uh, uh, a month or so before Christmas, and we, we gig around Ireland then, you know, so then it's time to put the feet up in, the, in January. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Pat, it's been great talking to well, you. But it's been an absolute pleasure. And it's thank taken you. us about 18 years to get here, but we did it. Thank but you for thank doing you very the much, interview. Robin. Thank it's you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm just getting better like vintage wine And I ain't lying down just marking time Well I burned a candle from dust to dawn Cause when I'm dead I'm a long time gone Oh I'm just the oldest robber in town Well I ain't ready for the rocking chair I can jump three steps while climbing the stairs And I ain't deaf cause I like my music loud When I'm drinking every bar around town you won't get me falling down Cause I'm the oldest robber in town Well I take on board what Neelium said It's better to burn out than fade away Oh I'm just the oldest robber in town Well, I guess I made my point of view 
I'll leave the rest right up to you Just take a chance, you got nothing to lose Just roll the dice and lay your bets Live each day with no regrets Come on now, you gotta take away those blues I'm burning the candle from dusk to dawn Cause when you're dead, you're a long time gone Oh, I'll be the oldest rocker in town Yeah, be the oldest rocker in town